We are Maria and Nicole. We're two secular homeschooling moms that have been been there, done done that. that. Good morning. Welcome to episode 21. Today, we're going to be talking about how to homeschool a child with a learning disability. We're going to be talking about the most common learning disabilities and whether or not you are capable to homeschool your child. We're also going to be talking about whether or not having a special need is going to hold your child back. We're going to be talking about all that and more. And as usual, we want to stress that our podcast is an inclusive space for your everyday parents that are looking for education options. We are not here to convince you to homeschool. Uh, We want to stress that you need to do what works for your child and for your family. Every family is different. Absolutely. And you know your children best. So uh, feel free to take what advice or information you get from here that works for you and chuck the rest. Good morning, Nicole. Good morning, Maria. Hey, how's it going? It's going well. I'm so glad you're here. We've got so much to talk about outside of this podcast. I know. I feel like that's all we talk about. So we haven't like caught up in a while. I know. I am excited because right now it's starting to warm up and we are talking about camping season. Oh my gosh. I know. I get to this point of year at this part of the year and I'm like, (laughs) uh, I just want to be sleeping outside in a tent. (laughs) A lot of people don't agree with that. I know. A lot of people think that's totally bonkers, but I love it. Well, and you kind of glamp uh, in in a tent where you bring, like, all your stuff's in a crate. You walk to your tent, and then you unload it, and you unpack, Mm -hmm. and you make it lovely. And then you turn over your crate, and it's your nightstand. It's my nightstand. I know. It's very fancy. (laughs) Oh, you are fancy. Yeah, I have, um, I'm trying to lock in some campsites for some friends, some adult friends. We were wanting to camp, and then... I asked Cameron, I'm like, are we going to camp this year? And he says, yes. So we need to. I know. Jillian would be in in for it, too. I do keep, like, we watch all these TikTok videos of people that, like, live in their van. And I'm just like, oh, we should rent, like, a camper van and, like, take a road trip. And she is like, (laughs) absolutely not. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my gosh. That's close proximity. Yeah, we need to plan a big family camping trip, see if any of our friends are into it. I think that we can find. Oh, we have our coffee bar. We need. I know. We always bring. We do bring. (laughs) The fanciest coffee bar to I mean, our we, camp. We're out. giving Starbucks a run for their money because mm-hmm. we like really like glamp it up with the yeah. coffee bar. Yeah. We also always have um, electric hookups because that way we can bring our instant, instant pots. Pot. <laughs> <laughs> so probably some camper is like just already turned us off here. <laughs> We were like, that's not, that's not okay. camping. So we have a really serious topic today to talk we about. Do. and But it's a really important thing to talk about. A lot of people struggle with their child's learning disability or disorders. And so you may be one of those parents that have considered or chosen to homeschool because your child does have a learning disability or needs an accommodation to help them learn. You may have battled your school system for a curriculum that is suitable to accommodate them Or you may have asked yourself, can I even homeschool my child? And the answer is a resounding, absolutely, yes, you can. Yeah, learning disabilities can make it difficult for children to keep up with peers academically. Um, It can lead to frustration, behavioral issues. Children with learning disabilities often struggle with social interactions, and they may have low self-esteem. It is important for children with learning disabilities to receive appropriate support in order to succeed academically and emotionally. And sometimes people may have the idea that kids with a learning disability aren't motivated or intelligent, or it's the parents fault. And this is absolutely false. We really need to widen the lens of how we look at these kids. Also, keep in mind that all students are unique and special and every single one of them has areas of strengths and areas of weaknesses. It's important to remember that there are functioning responsible adults everywhere around you that grew up navigating the system with a learning disability. Absolutely. And we'd really like to take a minute to thank our friends who offered up their personal stories and provided us with many of the resources for this episode. This was a really hard episode to create. (laughs) Um, You know, we don't have as much experience on this topic. And so we tried to make the information as general as possible. We are not experts no. <laughs> uh, by any stretch. Uh, we are not professionals in this field, you know, over this topic. And we really do want to do some future episodes where we actually have guest speakers come and, uh, you know, talk with us. We're, we're just, we're not there yet. <laughs> no, we're not. Podcasting is hard. Yes. And it's hard enough just the two of us. So Yeah, we don't we're... know how to bring a third person into this mess. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we will someday. We we will. And, Stay and tuned. actually yeah, and we've been asked to be on so, uh, some other people's podcasts. So mm-hmm. we are we're working our way towards that. So. Yes. <laughs> we're trying to get better every day. <laughs> we're just trying to get good enough to even speak at the conference oh, in gosh. June. <laughs> yeah, let's not think about it. No pressure. <laughs> okay. So all right, getting back to the topic. So what is a learning disability? Well, first of all, as we were researching this episode, we noticed that the terms learning disorder and learning disability were both used. So we looked up why, because we didn't really want to use the wrong verbiage if one was an outdated or even an offensive term. So we want to be sensitive on this topic. Absolutely. So uh, what we found was that learning disorder is a diagnostic term. A licensed professional, usually a psychologist, diagnoses a person with a learning disorder based on a list of symptoms. Learning disability is a legal term. Um, A public school identifies a student with a learning disability. Uh, People often will use these terms interchangeably, but those are what the actual definitions are. Yeah. It's funny. I have two sweet guys in my homeschool hiking group that are autistic. And one day the one introduced himself and he said that he was autistic and then explained to us that autism is a disability. And um, the other boy piped up and said, it's not a disability. It's a different ability. (laughs) And I really loved the way that they like reframed the word disability into different ability. It was really sweet. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah. It kind of reminds me of the very popular series, the Percy Jackson books Mm -hmm. um, by Rick Riordan. Um, When Percy, who is the main character in the book, finds out that he's a demigod, and that's a product of a god and a mortal, and he, along with other demigods, they all suffer from dyslexia. And this is explained to Percy that their dyslexia is a result of demigods' brains being hardwired to interpret ancient Greek, not English, and it's usually coupled with ADHD. And demigod dyslexia makes English a difficult language to interpret. Obviously, this is a fictional book, but the author, Rick Riordan's own child, struggled with dyslexia and ADHD. So that was a part of his inspiration. And it has the bonus effect of turning around perceptions of reading for a lot of his fans. Yeah, there were a lot of kids that really related to (laughs) to that. That book series is fantastic. Maybe I'm just a demigod. (laughs) I'm definitely extra special. Sometimes we use terms like developmental delay or gaps in knowledge to describe learning disabilities. Um, But learning disabilities are actually a neurological disorder. Uh, The most common, of course, being reading disabilities uh, with dyslexia as the most common of those. But the reality is that 5 to 10 percent of students in the U.S. have some sort of learning disability. Right. And there are many ways that professionals will go about diagnosing a learning disability. That includes tests that a psychologist might do and that would include possibly an aptitude test and an achievement test. And often they compare those two tests and then they might run even more tests. And once they have those results, it will help determine if there is a neurological disorder, a gap in knowledge, or that they just might need more exposure and more time to catch up. And typically these sorts of assessments are done around six or seven years old. Yeah. Uh, We have a mutual friend whose daughter was one of five six-year-olds and part of the pilot project at Scottish Rite to work with kids that were that young. And um, she actually said that there were, she got a lot of pushback from the homeschooling community at large when she pursued testing and remediation for her because she was so young. And, you know, obviously not everybody, you know, just wasn't supportive of yeah. her pursuing that. Yeah, I can see how that can happen with homeschoolers, since often we are preaching a wider range of what normal really is when it comes to learning and learning to read on your own schedule. Yeah. So we talk about that in other episodes, but really when there's something going on with a child there's special circumstances right and obviously like she knew there was something wrong right so that she knows she knows her you know got her to pursue it and sometimes there are even children with really high iqs that may be labeled gt which is gifted and talented in a school system that have a processing disorder and how frustrating these children must be to know that they are really capable and everything that they're capable of, but they just can't get the words down on paper or read fast enough. They're often so misunderstood, but have so much to offer 
knowing that and getting appropriate diagnosis is going to really help make your approach to how you teach them in your homeschool. Mm -hmm. We have another friend whose daughter was a reader, uh, but it was way below her desire and other skills. And what was eye opening to them was that she actually had a very common working memory disorder, which was far more of a problem. And uh, she said that they had kind of just labeled it as intellectual laziness, like before she was diagnosed. Her actual IQ testing was, you know, super high, um, except in this one area where it was below her other skills. I think she said it was like by three standard deviations. Um, That's a huge deficiency. They'd previously had other testing done through learning centers that said, no, she was fine. She's on grade level. And luckily, her friend continued to push her to have better testing and felt like the child was dyslexic. And turns out she was. So, you know, what a relief to know the truth and then be able to understand. And finally, then she could find resources and get started with an appropriate education plan. Right. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids have a lot of shame because it may take them so much longer than their friends to do something. It makes them feel like there's something wrong with them. And it's important that these children see themselves and also that we see them not as a deficient viewpoint, but from an asset viewpoint. So often we label and we put people in boxes because it's easy to identify them like that. But we know that people are multidimensional, every single human being, not just academically, but emotionally, but also in their talents. Right. And, you know, when you're able to personalize your child's education in your homeschool, you're going to be able to break that cycle of failure that they may feel. When they can feel small measures of success, you can help them change their whole internal dialogue and their mindset about themselves. It's going to help build their confidence and it will help really like in every aspect of their life. Yeah. These are often uh, the kids that grow up with the most resilience and persistence and grit. It's not just about academic success. Oh, my gosh, for sure. It's critical that you and your child learn about the diagnosis together. You need to become their advocate, but ultimately you really want your child to be their own advocate in life, Mm -hmm. whether it be in the classroom or even beyond. So they need to understand how they best learn and how they best process information. And honestly, there is no better ratio for education success than Mm -hmm. one-on-one. Being able to customize an education to your child's specific needs is, is, you know, what homeschooling is all about. Positive outcomes begin with having the right blend of teaching style, curriculum, and really just a keen understanding of how your child or teen learns best. Right. So how do I know if my child has a learning disability? That's going to be where we're going to have to, like, how are we going to figure this out? Well, learning disabilities usually fall within four broad categories. That would be spoken language, which would be listening and speaking. Then there is written language, which is reading, writing, and spelling. And then there's arithmetic, which would be calculation and concepts. And then there's reasoning, which is organization and integration of ideas and thoughts. So. Yeah. And today we're going to address uh, six common learning disabilities and how you can tailor your homeschool to accommodate your children and their individual needs. Each of these conditions can present with a range of symptoms and they can be diagnosed through a combination of medical and or educational assessments. Right. And there's a lot more. But, there are. You know. <laughs> yeah. We're kind of focusing on the top. Right. The top ones. Right. And OK, so the first one. So when many people think of a learning challenge, dyslexia often comes first to mind. Dyslexia is the number one learning disability that affects people of all ages. It affects a person's reading and language processing skills. If you are the parent of a child with dyslexia, you have probably searched long and hard for ways to help your child learn because children with dyslexia are often highly intelligent, creative, gifted, and productive, you can often capitalize on your students' strengths to make the most of homeschooling. You have complete control over the materials you teach with and can even choose a targeted homeschool curriculum that caters to dyslexic students. Yeah. So the second one is dysgraphia. Um, Dysgraphia is a learning disability that affects a person's ability to write, and it can manifest as difficulty with spelling or poor handwriting or trouble putting thoughts on paper. And I actually have a one of my children uh, has dysgraphia. So the third one is ADHD, which I have two 
kids with. So although ADHD is technically not considered a learning disability, research indicates that 30 to 50 percent of children with ADHD also have a specific learning disability and that the two conditions can interact to make learning extremely challenging. Right. And ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder that affects a person's ability to pay attention, control impulsivity, and regulate their level of hyperactivity. It's the second most common learning disability and can affect people of all ages. I know many people that have struggled all their life and then to be diagnosed as adults. Right. Yeah. ADHD makes it difficult to concentrate, which can lead to one child distracting others around them. So a classroom setting isn't always the best for these children. Many children with ADHD are disciplined for misbehaving. But often they can't control themselves and right. control their actions. Yeah. ADHD, if not treated, can interfere with a person's ability to succeed academically and socially. And it may lead to challenges in relationships and employment later on. You can give your child with ADHD an education that can be catered to their needs and help them gain confidence and perform better academically. Right. The next one would be dyscalculia. Dyscalculia is a learning disability that affects math skills. It can make it difficult for a person to understand math concepts, perform arithmetic calculations, and solve math problems. Lots of people dislike math, but they're eventually able to understand it with enough practice. Dyscalculia is more severe because it's diagnosing a learning disability that makes it challenging to understand even the most basic math concepts. Since math builds upon itself, children with dyscalculia can fall behind and struggle to catch up for years. The fifth one is dyspraxia. Dyspraxia is a neurological disorder that affects a person's ability to plan and coordinate movement. Uh, this can affect fine motor skills such as writing or tying shoelaces, as well as gross motor skills like balance and coordination. Uh, dyspraxia can also affect a person's ability to process information and perform tasks in the correct order. It is often referred to as a developmental coordination disorder, or DCD, and it's thought to be caused by problems with the brain's ability to process information about movement and coordination. Right, and although dyspraxia is a condition that affects someone's motor skills, it still has the potential to hinder specific learning. It mostly interferes with hand-eye coordination skills. Dyspraxia presents itself differently in each affected person, but some symptoms include poor balance and struggling with fine motor skills. Lastly, we have auditory and visual processing disorders. Visual tracking disorder, there are some families where parents feel it's necessary to read and write everything because their child has behavioral issues when they try and make them do their own writing for math or reading, but sometimes there's actually something else going on, and that can translate as a visual tracking problem, and it makes reading very difficult for them. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, it would be advisable to look into professional help. Right. We have a friend whose daughter had a visual tracking disorder, and they took her to a neurodevelopmental op optometrist where she was prescribed special prism glasses and weekly vision therapy. They couldn't have been happier with the results and said it was worth every single penny that they spent. Her daughter hated reading and struggled to do her work and now she's a happy thriving high schooler and she has her confidence back. Yep, and auditory kind of falls into that as well. So although central auditory processing disorder is not considered a learning disability itself, it can make some aspects of education particularly challenging. It's a condition in which the ears and brain don't work well together. And a child that struggles with a central auditory processing disorder is unable to process information properly. Their ears can hear it, but the brain does not organize and then store that information in a way that lets the child remember it easily. And a lot of times it's not always cut and dry. Sometimes children have a combination of any of these disorders. So, right. you know, each child is different when or it comes something, to Or something, yeah, something can present one way, but really be something else. And so, right. yeah, just really, um, you know, so you seek out professional help. Right. So just a reminder that this is a weekly episode. We drop one every Thursday morning just for you. And if you have any additional ideas or comments, please come and comment on our Facebook page on the episode thread or send us an email at info at btdthomeschool.com. We'd really love to hear from you. So now that we've covered some of the most common learning disabilities, you will want to ask, how do I homeschool a child with a learning disability? 
we likely see a disproportionate amount of students with learning disabilities in homeschool circles. Mm -hmm. This is typically because either the school has failed to meet their needs and the parents feel that they do better with one-on-one -on -one instruction. Right. Or sometimes the diagnosis comes earlier um, as parents have noticed something in their day-to-day -day interactions that might have slipped by in a busy classroom. So for whatever reason, in order to homeschool a child with a learning disability, there are some steps that you want to take. First, there's diagnosis. If you or someone who knows your child suspects a learning disability, you may want to have a complete evaluation done by a psychologist or a specialist to get a clear picture of their strengths and weaknesses. You may also seek testing through an educational diagnostician. These are available through school districts or an independent evaluator or a private provider or a medical institution like a pediatric psychology group. Scottish Rite here in Dallas is where some of our friends have gone to get help. Check with your state homeschool laws or school districts to find out about evaluation services that might be available to you through that. Sometimes these resources even provide support for all the families. Yeah. You also want to learn about your child's diagnosis. So you know your child best and no one loves them more or is a bigger cheerleader for them than you can be. You know that they're more than a label and you are the one that can help them reach their full potential. You want to do all that you can to learn as much as possible about their diagnosis so that you are able to understand how best to support them. You're going to need all the understanding and tricks in your toolbox to aid them and to recognize their difficulties different abilities. Right. And that's our job. Be their advocate for yeah. sure. Yeah. So the next thing would be to educate yourself on treatment options. Learn about what your options are for treatments. There may be medications or therapies or other interventions available to aid you in your new journey. Seek advice and information from your student's diagnosing professional and their pediatrician. Other treatments may be available by working with an integrative physician too. Yeah. And there's more and more types of therapies available for various disabilities and special needs mm -hmm. like every day. Art and music therapy. There's pet therapy, behavioral and cognitive therapy. There's traditional or standard speech language, vision, physical and occupational therapies uh, that are common treatments. Unfortunately, nearly all health insurance plans exclude coverage for educational evaluations. Many insurance companies do not cover for testing that's educational in nature. Sometimes it is FSA eligible, but, you know, sometimes if you don't have insurance, you're kind of tough luck. Right. So in some cases, testing and therapies might be financially out of reach if you're seeking private care, but they might be free through the public school system. One of our friends had to make that temporary choice for her son, but they were able to do the testing and assign a course of action. I think he spent about a year in the school system and then he was able to <laughs> oh, yeah. and come he home. Was, <laughs> I remember he was sitting there, he was really struggling with reading mm -hmm. and I think it's middle school-ish. Yeah. <laughs> He was like in calculus or something on math. Right, right. So his math that year was like, I think it was pre-algebra, and he was like, I'm breezing through that. Yeah. But I remember that year. Another thing you were talking about, those different therapies, something really cool is uh, the library system does things like they'll bring in animals, and you'll read to the animals and yeah, things like that. And I've known some, cute. some friends that with children who struggle with reading on this level, and they've really taken advantage of that. So I like that the community's coming together for that. Yeah. Again, uh, research the resources available to you. Some states give homeschoolers with learning disabilities access to special services. When you're seeking support, you need to seek support of all kinds, from professionals to other families. Finding supportive systems and people and groups is a great way to get personalized answers and practical resources that have worked for their families. So take advantage of that. Many of our friends have been through the struggle, say over and over again, that other homeschool moms have been through it so it was an invaluable resource for all of them so make sure that you reach out to those communities yeah for parent support you may also want to try groups like the international dyslexia association and decoding dyslexia national charitable organizations like scottish Rite, uh, easter seals and the arc uh, those offer resources support directories um, and sometimes grants and scholarships and other helpful tools right SPED Homeschool is another national nonprofit organization that offers encouragement in an online community to support families impacted by special needs. They have all kinds of resources from teaching tools to planning guides and empowering media. And uh, we are we're including all of these links in our show notes. Right, it's going to yeah. be a busy one. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so you really need to get real with your child. So we mentioned this earlier, but it's critical that you and your child learn about their diagnosis together. Ultimately, you want them to be their own advocate 
advocate in life, whether it be in the classroom and beyond. So they need to understand how they best learn and process information. You really want them to understand that they are not defined by a diagnosis. One in five people have a learning disability and there are so many bright and successful people out there who also share the same learning disability. Understanding these difficulties and how their disability will affect them while also realizing what their strengths are and ultimately learning how to work around or with all this help that we've talked about to help them along their life. Yeah, one uh, book that we've seen mentioned quite a bit is called Eight Great Smarts. It's by Dr. Kathy Koch, and it's a great resource. There is also a homeschool version of that called Eight Great Smarts for Homeschoolers, which is a collaboration between Tina Hollenbeck and Dr. Koch. And there's probably not a greater life skill than self-advocacy. So some other resources like the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity and um, understood.org can also help you find resources to educate your child and teach them how to advocate for themselves. And then allow last highly rated book is The Dyslexia Empowerment Plan by Ben Foss. I I was reading the review on that one and it was actually kind of interesting because he's like an entrepreneur out in Silicon Valley and uh, he talks about how there are so many Silicon Valley execs that have learning disabilities. Like it's very, uh, you know, smarts. Right. It's, with it's other little, parts of your brain. Like, but they have, they have, they're super empowered and they are successful. So yeah. there's a lot of potential for these kids. So let's give that. Those. Right. Another thing you might want to think about is to allow for accommodations. So accommodations will help a student take in information or demonstrate what they know, but at their level and at their ability. Decide what kind of accommodations your child might need and make sure to discuss these with other people who may be in a supervisory role in their life, like an outside teacher or tutor or maybe a coach or other instructors. Some common accommodations that may be of use may be audiobooks or dictation or oral work in lieu of writing. Other accommodations may be frequent breaks or extra time to do a task. This is something you may want to document in your homeschool records. For sure, for sure. Elizabeth Hamlet's website is uh, ldadvisory.com, and she offers advice and makes presentations based on her professional experience as a college-level learning disability specialist. So um, you can look on her site to find out about college disability accommodation system and how they're handled in the admissions process. Uh, One of our friends emphasized that they did private evaluation when their child was younger, but then they did a medical one again in high school so that they could secure extended time on like high stakes tests like your ACT and SAT. Yeah. The next thing would be to have confidence in yourself. You are your child's best teacher and you are totally able to give them a completely personalized education plan. One of our friends when we were talking and doing all our research had emphasized that you really need to be willing to constantly adapt and change what you're doing. So if something's not working, change it up. Mm -hmm. That's the benefit of homeschooling. Some of our friends have been able to teach their dyslexic children to read. Others have had to seek outside assistance. One used Scottish Rite here in Dallas and said that her student responded very well to the structure of the program. Yep. And another friend was able to teach one of her kids with dyslexia to read, but not the second child. The second child received intensive remediation through a reading specialist who was trained in uh, various research validated multi-sensory programs that work when other approaches fail. So these kind of programs address underlying weaknesses that might make reading, spelling, writing, and comprehension difficult. Right. So you're going to find that there is no single best curriculum for your child. And I would encourage you to really tune in to their specific strengths and weaknesses and personal preferences and just customize the best homeschool curriculum options for them. That might mean choosing a blend of homeschool curricula. Parents should read to their kids help them sound out words and guide them through their reading activity. But you know what they can't learn for their child. That's where using a reading program that accommodates their disability can really aid in independent mastery. Yep. Um, Online courses, read alouds, interactive videos, field trips, or, you know, just physical movement, manipulatives, group or co-op learning. These can all provide exciting and engaging ways that your child will succeed in homeschooling. Um, And ideally, you're going to want to choose learning tools that, you know, utilize techniques that best fit their learning style. Uh, Maybe uh, self-paced so they can move ahead when they've mastered a concept. You want to choose things that are multi-sensory and include plenty of visual or audio and instruction and support depending again depending on their needs 
You also want to include um, instruction in all the rules of reading and strategies, both for decoding and spelling new words, um, especially for dyslexia students. Right. And you want to find something that builds on existing reading, writing, and math skills, and something that encourages kids to become active learners through exploration and discovery, introduces new learning opportunities in a safe and supportive environment. And the last and most important, it balances learning with fun. So kids learn best when they're having a good time. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, a couple of recommendations we heard from friends were the program All About Reading. Another one that's recommended is Reading Eggs. We use that in our homeschool, and I love Reading Eggs. And Hooked on Phonics, we use that for a short time. While these programs aren't specifically designed for learning disabilities like dyslexia, they can help a lot of kids that are struggling. Yeah, a couple other recommendations we got were for Sounds Abound, which is Listening, Rhyming, and Reading by Hugh Katz and Tina Williamson. This program built Uh, skills students need to become proficient readers with an evidence-based systematic progression of lessons. The lessons are uh, organized into five skill areas in order of development, and they have a lot of picture-supported lessons and progresses to listening tasks without pictures. So that is a great one. Another one is Sound Foundation's uh, Dancing Bears. Uh, These are easy-to-use books developed to teach uh, reading and spelling to young children and students struggling with literacy. And uh, they say on their website that their books are designed to empower our amateur teachers, a.k.a. parents. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm a professional at this point. <laughs> okay. So our friends also recommended typing for writing. I know that this has helped a lot of kids that struggle. Dyslexi font is a typeface that's specially designed for people with dyslexia, which enhances the ease of reading and comprehension. To design the dyslexia-friendly typeface, all typography rules and standards were ignored. Instead, all the challenges of dyslexia are taken as a starting point. There's an array of products you can add to um, like Microsoft Word, Google Chrome, etc. So add yeah. those in. Um, another friend introduced us to Grammarly, which I was telling you about the right. other day. And Excited I was about like, that. I know, I it was really cool. It's a writing support program that um, supports streamlined and effective writing. Like anybody can use this. Like they were talking about, you know, people in business that are trying to write group project and things like that. Anyway, their uh, suggestions help identify and replace complicated sentences with more efficient ones or refresh repetitive language, uphold accurate spelling, punctuation and grammar. It catches typos and missing punctuation situation or commonly confused words before they become distracting to your reader. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a spell check, except it's more like it it catches all kinds of. I'm excited. I got to check out Grammarly. I'm going to. No, you really do. I'm going to incorporate that in my own school. I'm super excited. It looked like a really. Yeah, it was really awesome. Awesome. Okay. So check out Grammarly. We'll have the link on our website. Okay. So a couple of our friends also chose to become trained in the Orton Gillingham approach to better help their students, which is a direct, explicit, multi sensory structures, sequential diagnostic and prescriptive way to teach literacy when reading, writing and spelling does not come easily to individuals like those with dyslexia. It is most properly understood and practiced as an approach, not a method, program or system. In the hands of a well-trained and experienced instructor, it is a powerful tool and an exceptional depth and flexibility. And is it not just so cool that our friends would be like, I'm just going to go get trained in this so that I can teach my own kid. I'm telling you, the people that are choosing to homeschool are ones that are, you know, we're advocating for our kids. We're doing this. You don't take this decision to homeschool your children lightly. And so if your child needs something special, by golly, these are the parents that are going to do it. Yeah, it's incredible. So more power to you guys. Yep. You guys are awesome. Awesome. We will include some of the links and ideas and everything that we're talking about on our show notes on our website. So be sure to check that out after you listen. We would love it if you would take a second to go out there and like and rate us. Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio. We are on all those streaming platforms. So go out and check us out. Give us a thumbs up. So will having a learning disability hold my child back? That's a big question. Yeah, it doesn't have to. And remember that as homeschoolers, there is no behind. We're not keeping up with anything. The biggest benefit of homeschooling is the flexibility. Some other advantages of homeschooling your child with a learning disability might be a quieter learning environment in a familiar setting. 
This can reduce anxiety and pressure for your child. Yeah. Also, uh, daily progress. In a school environment, you may have gotten feedback from teachers at the end of the day or weekly, but as a homeschooler, you're going to be able to track progress daily and see your child blossom. And you're also there if your day goes bust. Yes. If you're having that terrible day. Yeah. Another thing is that you can set the pace. Spend as much time as you need on concepts or skills that are hard for your child and just move on when mastering something. So that's a great thing is to be able to cater it to them. Yeah. Uh, You also have complete choice of curriculum and resources. Uh, Children have different learning styles. Sometimes music and movement are better than sitting still and listening. And there are so many different approaches that you can take, just like we suggested in that last section there. Right. Another thing would be quality of social opportunities. You can join local groups that that encourage your kids to relate to one another on their own terms. You can pick your activities and extracurriculars and, you know, and when something doesn't work on a social outlet, you don't have to go. Right. And you may have some concerns about things like not having as much structure as a school environment. You might worry um, that you have fewer resources than a school might. You may be worried about having less social interaction and getting burned out. But the point is you really want to focus on the things that you can fix. Right. There are things that you have much more control over, but you still can't control everything that might go wrong in a homeschool environment. Instead of thinking about the resources that aren't available to your homeschool child, turn it around and think about how you can fill in the gaps and gain valuable skills. Yeah. Um, Every public school child eligible for special education has an individualized education program, or an IEP. As a homeschooling parent, you may not have to have one at home, uh, but it's a good idea to set goals in the beginning of the year and monitor progress over time. An IEP, or a list of accommodations, can also help you communicate with specialists, and there are free sources online that can help you generate your own. Right. A common fear for parents as their child with disabilities grows up is that they will sit up home all day after graduation and do nothing. And this is a normal fear, but it really doesn't have to be your reality. Yeah, one of our friends is using a vocational rehabilitation service for youth, for uh, older youth, like young adults. They updated testing for her adult child and they help uh, prepare for post-secondary education and or employment opportunities. Some of these services are eligibility and need-based and uh, some even pay tuition and books at the community college. So I, I'm linking to uh, one of the Texas sites that is like this. Right. Ultimately, know yourself and your child. Your child with disabilities could thrive under your tutelage if you have the patience and courage to lead the way. You know your child best. Yeah. So and that was a lot of that was well, a lot of information. That was a lot. <laughs> We've worked so hard on this episode. Yeah. You have done so much research, Nicole. Oh my goodness. I appreciate wow. all well, we have so many families and like we talked about the imbalance of homeschoolers that have special needs is is huge compared yeah. to a school system because a lot of people are failed by the system. Right. They end up there after other things haven't worked out. So right. there are gonna be so many resources. We have links and book recommendations and really it's just a matter of being being proactive and choosing to homeschool, you're already there. You're already right. setting your child up for success. And again, we are not experts at, in any capacity. Yeah. Um, if you are a parent that has kids with learning disabilities and you have additional resources, I, we would love to know what those are. Like comment them on our Facebook, um, page Facebook posts, yeah. uh, any, anything that you can share for parents or send them to us and we can use them in a future episode as well or right. add them to our show notes. Um, it was really, this was a, a really a group a community group project uh, when we reached out to a lot of our friends for yeah. information. So. Yeah, that was great. So, okay. I think it's going to help a lot of people. I and hope so. We put a lot of effort into this one. All right. Our next episode is episode 22, Homeschooling in the Wild. Uh, what are the benefits of outdoor nature time? How do you get your family to spend more time outside? And how do you incorporate nature study into your homeschool? All right. Those that's are going to be great. Yes. That's one of my favorite topics. So, <laughs> All right. This is going to be a good one. Okay. See you yeah, next time. See ya. Cheers. Be sure to check us out on our website at btdthomeschool.com, as in been there, done that, btdthomeschool.com. You can join our mailing list and get news and updates on future podcasts. And be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, at the BTDT Been There, Done That Homeschool Podcast. <laughs>